Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finnern, pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Today is Friday, May 14th, and we are living in the hope of the resurrection, but also the hope of the ascension, where our Lord reigns on high and the world is under his feet. And it is a joy to be this time of year, because in this hope, we study the gift of the inspired and true word of God. And as we look at the Old Testament, we put on our Christ goggles, and that is never more needed than today as we look at the kings in chapters 1st and 2nd. First Kings chapters 15 and 16. And in that light of Jesus, we look at these because, well, there's a lot of brokenness, war, destruction, and sin. All this reminds us of the brokenness in the world, but also the brokenness in ourselves and our Lord Jesus, who became broken for you. So let's dig in this morning. The gifts are ready, ready for you. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. A special thanks to our friends this morning at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. To help us be strengthened by God's Word, we have with us our special guest, Pastor Keith Lynch of Grace Lutheran Church in Naples, Florida. Pastor Lynch, welcome to Thy Strong Word. Hey, thank you, Brady. It's great to be here. Pastor, this is our first time together on Thy Strong Word, so I, I was going to ask you if you could spend a few moments introducing yourself and the work of the saints at Grace Lutheran. Yeah, so uh, I've been a pastor about 26, 25, 6 years, somewhere around there. Graduated from Fort Wayne uh, Seminary in uh, 1996, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, went out to Idaho, was a pastor in Idaho, went to a parish out there for a couple of years, and went back to my vicarage congregation in Ohio, I was in Ohio for about nine years at uh, Trinity Zanesville. And then uh, from there, I went into the Ministry of the Armed Forces and worked in the, uh, I was a chaplain in the Air National Guard at the time, and went full-time with the Guard Bureau and worked in Washington, D.C., deployed chaplains in the War on Terror. Uh, did that for a few years, and then I got the call to come to Grace and uh, in Naples, Florida. And someone's got to suffer through with being uh, the pastor in uh, Naples, Florida, and I guess it had to be me. So yeah. it's a wonderful congregation. Yeah, Grace is fantastic. I've been here 12 years, and uh, just, this, just this wonderful um, liturgical uh, singing congregation. They love uh, the liturgy. They love, they love music. Uh, I've got a great staff. Uh, Jonathan Berner is our parish director of music, and wow. Joe Mogelvang, our director or DCE, a director of Christian education, and then we've got a, a preschool and just some wonderful people that I've gotten to spend time with and work with down here. It's a great congregation. Like you said, that would be a very tough life around January to be serving at Grace <laughs> in Naples. You know, it's funny when we uh, we do like a little speaker series every, every um, winter, uh, January, February, and it's amazing when we call people from the north and say, would you like to come to Naples, Florida, in uh, January, February, they they they're all excited about coming down. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. I've, I've not I've not had anybody go. No, I'm not coming to the, I'm not coming to Southern Florida in January. So. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, here in Minnesota right now, this is the best time of year to be in Minnesota. The bugs haven't come out yet. You can still wear a sweater, but the sweatshirt, but you also can just enjoy the outdoors. And that lasts for about two weeks. And then then the mosquitoes come out. So, yeah, yeah. that's our life. Yeah, that's our life. I was just, my, my son, one of my sons and I went out west to Wyoming this past week. We were up, you know, kind of uh, traveling around. I guess I'll say it. We were bear hunting. Nice. In uh, Wyoming. We did not get a bear, but we saw a few bears, saw a lot of wildlife. Beautiful weather. It was snowy and cold, and, and uh, it was fantastic. So, but it's always nice to come back to, you know, 75, 80, 85 um, here, here in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Well, thank you for sharing that. And the Lord bless you as you continue to serve our Lord in that capacity. What we're going to do today is as we look at First Kings, it is a crazy um, back and forth that we continually hear. And so what I want to do is begin our time in prayer. Pastor, can you begin our time in prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray. Uh, Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer this day, giving you thanks uh, for these uh, kings who serve uh, God's people. Uh, They were not always good, and uh, they always were sinful and filled with all kinds of struggles. 
Uh, we pray, Lord, that we can learn from them and see uh, how you work through them despite their sins to bring about your glory and the good of your people. Uh, we ask now that you be with us, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Pastor, Pastor Lynch, chapters 15 and 16 are not the, exactly the most exciting uh, parts of Holy Scripture. So, one, once again, thank you for being our guest to study this today. You could have chosen maybe more exciting ones, but here we are. It's still God's Word. It's still inspired. Um, do you want to give us, is there any background or thematic uh, uh, um, information you want to give us as we, to help us out this morning? So uh, we don't know the writer of the book of Kings. We're not really sure who that is. And, um, but, you know, the writer of the, the book of Kings and also Chronicles, I think, that those two books go hand in hand. So when you're reading First Kings, Second Kings, you really ought to be reading First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, and then even, you know, um, you know the, the First and Second Samuel in there as well, because that covers all of this, this great period and this wonderful information about all these different kings. If God's people ask for kings, and God says, you really don't want that, but if you, know, if you, if you push me, press me, and I'll give you what you want. And so, <laughs> you know, God grants them the kings, which, you know, the judges and, and, and all of these difficult um, sinners who, who kind of lead the people down a terrible path at times. Um, what we have in 15 and 16 are a little bit of um, Judah, the, the uh, you know kind of the southern kingdom and Israel the northern kingdom we kind of go a little bit back and forth uh, we start with Judah and then we kind of hit Israel and get Israel for the rest uh, because um, there's one king in Judah that lasts a long time he's king for uh, uh, over 40 years uh, but uh, you know you kind of get a picture of it, it's so different than today I would imagine life that we live today with all of the struggles leaders that come and go. I mean, whether you like the leader that's in, in office today or whether you like the leader that was in office before, it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is they're both sinful people and they're going to do things that are probably not pleasing to the Lord or, or good to the people, but yet the Lord still uses them mm. for His glory and for our good. It's just difficult sometimes to see. But that's, I think, what we're looking at when we read through the, these uh, two chapters in Kings. And that and that's a great overview, um, especially as you mentioned First and Second Chronicles. I mean, there's an opportunity of a very rich understanding of the history. Uh, Dr. Meyer and his commentary, which now that we're in chapters 15 and 16, he wrote he wrote a commentary on uh, uh, chapters one through 11, which was huge, and now 12 through 22, which is about the same size. So there's tons of information on this. And he mentions right away that this history gives us a theology, which I thought was very helpful for us to look at it is because we can look at history and just see it as history, but we see how God worked then. And it brings us to today, like you said so well, that God put those kings in, in, in place as he puts today's leaders in place. And that's a very helpful understanding. And plus, like you said, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel gives us the richness of all of this. The problem we have is that th those are a lot of chapters and a lot of information. So it's hard to pull it all together. But yet our Lord has given us that gift to help us understand how he works and the grace that he gives to all generations at all times. Any, any last thoughts? Think, Go ahead. I think you also have, like, it's difficult to read because uh, I think people get hung up on the names. Yeah. And um, so so here's what I do. Um, you know, faith comes by hearing, right? And the scriptures were meant to be heard, not necessarily just read. So, I mean, you're going to read through them and you're going to read those names. What I've done is, hey, you have a Bible app on your phone, like uh, for ESV, or you have a Bible, you know, Bible Gateway, whatever, whatever. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on on the air or not, yep, but whatever. You yep, you Bible are. Program you use, there's probably a, a, a read app where you just click on it and it'll read it. Yep. Um, and that way you can follow along and actually hear those names being pronounced, probably correctly, maybe not correctly, but by somebody else, and you're not struggling through those names. And I do love the commentary. I did purchase both commentaries uh, on uh, First Kings uh, from. Uh, uh, Concordia, because 
not only, not only are they great, but uh, Walter Meyer the uh, third was one of my professors at the seminary. Sure, and uh, he's also the officiant for when my wife and I got married. Oh, so uh, a <laughs> little shout out to, to William Free out there. Love you and uh, uh, you know, miss you. So. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. That is cool, and we had him. We had him on the program to begin First Kings, and we're we're going to get him also towards the beginning of Second Kings. And what a blessing that is! And my suggestion also, as as uh, Pastor Lynch has brought up, going on a Bible app. Also, KFUO now has an app, so look up KFUO Radio on your app store, and you'll be able to find us and download our uh, programs at any time. As it says, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. So let's dig into the text, and once again. As you said, uh, we're going we're gonna to plow through these names, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit work. So we'll start just verses 1 through 8, for we have a lot to cover today. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, Abijam began to reign over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maka, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins that his father did before him. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him and establishing Jerusalem because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now there was a war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. The rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did are not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. And Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his place. Okay, uh, I want to see if you want to highlight any themes that we will see because this, these first eight verses are very similar to the rest of our stories that we will hear. So any themes or thoughts as we look at the first uh, king uh, that we hear of today? Yeah, so uh, for a while now, so we're, we're talking about Judah, we're talking about the, the southern kingdom, and, uh, and you're going to hear about how these kings were, a lot of them were, were wicked, right? They were not, they, they did not follow in the footsteps of, um, of Yahweh. They, they did not have, a, their whole heart was not wholly dedicated to Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Now, this is an interesting one with Abijam because, um, so, uh, uh, Abishalom, that's Absalom. That's David's, mm-hmm. um, son, and uh, we all know what happened there. He, you know, went after his father and, uh, you know, first he killed his brother and then he tried to take over the kingdom and that didn't work out too well for Absalom. Um, he ended up being uh, put to death. But um, we have, we have the, this is the daughter of um, Absalom that is the mother of Abijam. And, um, and, and so probably, you know, his father is uh, Rehoboam, and, and there's this war going on between Re- the northern and the southern kingdoms with, with Rehoboam uh, in uh, the south with Judah and Jeroboam with the king of Israel in the north. And they keep fighting back and forth all these, all these years. So you have all these, these battles. Now, it's interesting. I love how they say, well, you know, um, Abijam was not like his father David. He didn't have the heart of, of David, sure. meaning he was a sinner that, that wandered away from the Lord more than he remained faithful. David he just had one problem, well, probably many problems, but the one that we have in the scriptures is Uriah the Hittite. He you know, had him murdered and stole his life, and, and you know we know that story. Uh, and, and, and so... Um, uh, while David remained faithful to the Lord, repented of his sin, turned from his sin, came back to the Lord, Abijam was not following in the path of, of uh, his, uh, you know, his, his great grandfather David. He was kind of wandering uh, and not not repenting of his sin and turning from his sin. And that seems to be the problem, I think, with most of the kings that we're going to go through. Even even uh, Asa, the next king, uh, who reigned after Abijam in Judah for a long time, his main issue is um, he goes after um, 
he seeks help not from the Lord, but from someone else. And we'll get to that in a minute. But, mm-hmm. but I mean, I think the heart, it's a matter of the heart, right? So uh, these kings are, are wandering and trusting. So fear, love, and trust in God above all things. That's the first commandment, and that's meaning, right? Uh, and, and so they're wrestling with that fear, love, and trust in God above all things. They're, they're wandering away from that, uh, which then is, just, is really, you, you break the first commandment, you break them all. And, and, um, and so they're, they're wrestling with that first commandment issue of trusting in God above all things, and they, they seem to be wandering away. And that, that is going to be kind of the theme throughout what we see um, in the rest, of these, the rest of these two chapters, is these kings are brought on, uh, the Lord is using them, but they, they continue to wander away from him and trust in other things other than the Lord. Well, and that is a, a wonderful way for us to look at this today because one of the real struggles that you read is they're like, what do you, what do you mean David was faithful? Like in all of the commandments, it's hard to understand at times because like he says, except for the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And, and you, you put it well, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of faith. And it wasn't so much that David sinned less. It said he had repentance and faith. Um, and one of Solomon's issue, and we had this on Monday, I believe it was, with Pastor John, Le- uh, Tuesday, excuse me, with John Lekomsky, was he talked about how when Solomon prayed for wisdom, one of the things that he should have prayed for and what we should pray for is faith. And I thought that was a very, very good thing for us to look is not give us wisdom on how to make sure we run a tight ship or how we are very effective or like, you know, for for you in the military, too. You want to make sure the or, things are in order. Obviously, you pray for that. But also we pray for faith because that was the issue with all of these kings that did evil in the sight of the Lord is that they lacked faith in the Lord. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, so uh, what's it like to be king? Mm. You know, <laughs> so you you are you are the king of the people, right? You you have all authority, power. People answer to your uh, um, you know desires. Your uh, so I, I would imagine being king is really a a, a, fright, a frightening uh, position to be in, and and as, so it is a matter of the heart and. I, I, you know, when, when Luther talked about sinning boldly, I think what he really means by that, and I could, this is my thought on it, I, I think what he means is recognize who we are as Christians, that we are sinners at, at our core, and we're constantly going to be falling short of God's glory. And, and so, you know, Jesus said, I came for the sick, not for the healthy. So if I recognize my sickness, my, my ailment, my sin, more and more, then that means that I'm going to recognize my need for Jesus more and more and more and more. And these kings, I think, in the mo- for the most part, don't recognize because they're kings, right? Because they have this position of authority and power. And, uh, and yeah, they, they probably believe that God is using them, um, but they see it more as a, you know, this, I am king, and not I am a sinner. David recognized that he was still a little shepherd boy. Right, that he was that he was still, um, you know, this this um, young little boy before the Lord. He was not. He was king, but you know, other than other than the, the, the wrestling with, um, you know, um, don't don't sit on rooftops with binoculars. I guess is the, 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 right? <laughs> and uh, you know, you see what you see. You, you, you know, then, then recognize who you are, and uh, and David does that, mm-hmm. right? David right. recognizes who he is before God, a sinner, and in need of God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness, and that he's not, even though he's king, he's a sinner. And that, I think, is what uh, the writer of, of, the, of the, uh, you know, the kings is, is saying. David recognizes who he is, and, and most of these kings, they only see themselves as king. They don't see themselves as standing before the Lord, someone who will have to answer before the Lord, and and, um, and and this is a great lesson, I think, for pastors and congregations, right? Yep. Um, that as we stand before the Lord, now, I certainly uh, don't want to, uh, I, I want the Lord to say, well done, good and faithful servant, um, but, but I re- recognize that um, if he says that, it's not because of me. Right. Um, it's because of what he's worked through me and done 
in me and, and the forgiveness that he has won for me in his son. And um, so I think that's the big struggle with most of these kings. They're king. And, um, you know, pride goes before the fall. And oh, I think that, mm-hmm. that's definitely a, a wrestling point for all of these, these kings. And I like how you said that because there is a, a certain amount of, um, I guess, sympathy you have for them because the reality is that they're under a lot of pressure. And then you think about yourself that when stress gets high, when when you have to get a lot done, one of the last things that we do is go to the Lord. <laughs> we yeah. start thinking of ourselves. We start thinking about strategy. We start thinking about you know, time management. All these things, I'm not saying they're wrong, but one of the last things we look back to and look toward is the Lord for help because we trust in ourselves more than we do him. And like you said so well, yeah. this is the first yeah. commandment issue. So let's keep moving here. We have a lot of verses to get through. Um, but that, that yeah, was, I, do, I do love, I, I, one, one little comment about there, I do love the fact that in the catechism, when, when you talk about prayer, you know, God, it, it, it appears, you all have, we all have those friends that only come around when they need something, right? Those fair weather friends. Right. And, and we kind of go, uh, you know, okay. And we give in and we do what they ask and we help them. But, but, that's the way God is. With, uh, God wants fair weather. Not, not that he, not, I shouldn't say it this way. God has no problem with fair weather prayer people, yeah, right? Yeah, he good. Wants, it's especially when we're in need that God says, come and pray. Um, and I, I find that that to me is the most beautiful thing in the whole world. Yeah, he wants us to pray all the time, wants us to come to him all the time, wants him to trust in him all the time. But it's especially when we're in those hours of darkest need that, that, the Lord is there saying, come, right? And I think that's a beautiful thing. Just, that, just, that was just a, that's a side note. But I'm glad. Dive in. I'm glad you, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you interrupted me. That was, those are perfect words for us to remember. God has no problem with fair weather prayer people, which I think we all can relate with. So let's plow through here. Um, we are going to read <laughs> verses 9 through 32. 9 through 32. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa began to reign over Judah, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maka, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as David his father had done. He put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. He also removed Maka, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made an abominable, uh, abominable image for Asherah. And Asa cut down her image and burned it in the brook of Kidron. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all his days. And he brought into the house of the Lord the sacred gifts of his father and his own sacred gifts, silver and gold and vessels. And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah. And he might that he might permit no one to go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and gave them into the hands of his servants. And King Asa sent to them Ben-Hadad and the son of Tabermon, the son of Hazion, king of Syria, who lived in Damascus, saying, Let there be a covenant between me and you as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I am sending you a present of silver and gold. Go break your covenant with Basha, king of Israel, and he may, that he may withdraw from me. And Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of the armies against the cities of Israel and conquered Ishan, Dan, Abel, Beth, Maka, and the Chinaroth, which is in the land of Naphtali. And when Basha heard of it, he stopped building Ramah and lived in Tirzah. Then King Asa made a proclamation to all Judah. None was exempt. And they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber, which is Basha, had been building. And with them King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. And the rest of the acts of Asa, all his might, all that he did, and the cities that he built, are not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? But in his old age, he was diseased in his feet. And Asa slept with his fathers and buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. 
Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the way of his father, and, and in his sin, which he made Israel to sin. Basha, son of Ahijah, and the house of Issachar, conspired against him. And Basha struck him down at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, for Nadab and Israel were laying siege to, the, to Gibbethon. So Basha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. And as soon as he was king, he killed the house of Jeroboam. He left the house of Jeroboam, not one that breathed, until he had destroyed it according to the word of the Lord. And he spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. It was for the sins of Jeroboam that he sinned, that he made Israel to sin, because of the anger to which he provoked the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did are not written in the book of the Chronicles of the king of Israel. And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Well, I'm going to take a little break. Um, and you tell me what just happened there. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Oh man. So, uh, you know, we, we're going from, um, uh, we're going from by, uh, to Asa and, uh, Asa, the king of Judah is there for a long time. He reigns for many years, uh, as, um, uh, 31 years. And he, uh, actually, uh, it says was a good king in, in many ways. Uh, done, did a lot of good things. In fact, uh, he removed his uh, his mother as queen mother removed. She was putting up all these images of uh, for uh, Baal and uh, the Asherah pole. She was you know worshiping the, the uh, fertility gods of Cana and doing all these things. And so he removed her as queen mother and. And he, he did a lot of good things. He you know, got rid of the temple prostitutes, and he was he was trying to follow the way of the Lord. And, and for the most part, he did that. Um, the, the struggle comes in when he has to go up against King Basha of Israel, and they're at war. And Basha has set up kind of a he is he has put an encampment uh, real close to uh, one of the cities that belong to Judah, and so. Um, what Asa does, and this is the, the, I think where we're talking about this fall into sin where he doesn't trust the Lord. Instead of going to the Lord, um, Asa goes to, uh, the, uh, one of the kings of the, I believe it's the Assyrians, uh, and gives him a bunch of money. Mm. And he takes this money out of the, the, uh, the stores of the temple. And it's, apparently it's a large sum. Because he gives it to him as a bribe, and immediately uh, this uh, this this king turns on Basha, and um, and and becomes an ally of Asa, uh, and and so that's basically what you have there. Where Asa then protects his people, like we said, he, he's wanting to protect his people, and rather than going to the Lord for trust for, for that uh, protection, he turns to. Um, one of the pagan kings to, to bring him uh, rescue hmm. uh, and to bring rescue for his people. And it works. It works. <laughs> it does work. Uh, they, they, um, you know, they, they take back all of the uh, timber and building supplies that, uh, uh, that Basa was using to build this fortification uh, in Arima. And, you know, and, and so, so, uh, it, it, there's a victory there. There's a victory there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that's kind of what you have. Uh, that's why it says, you know, that he kind of died. He had these problems with his feet in his old age. Right? He had these, these disease of, in his feet. And, and maybe that was because of his lack of um, following the Lord in this case, that the Lord allowed some illness to be him in his feet. But he does sleep with his fathers, and he's buried in the city of David. And he was, um, and he was a, a, a fairly decent king, uh, other than this struggle that he had with uh, Basa. Hmm. Uh, 
Let's, well, it is, it is interesting, right? It, it, it is. You know what? And we need to take our break right now. So let's get back to the interesting part as it continues. Uh, we are studying 1 Kings chapter 15 and 16 with Pastor Keith Lynch, and we'll be right back. What's happening in Germany's Lutheran churches, where Iranian refugees are flooding through the doors? What new opportunities for sharing the Christian faith are arising in communist Vietnam, and how can my church play a part? Mission speakers, all LCMS pastors from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, will come to your church free of charge to preach and lead Bible studies tying into this exciting work going on all around the world. To schedule your speaker, call LHF at 800 554 0723. And welcome back. We are studying 1 Kings with Pastor Keith Lynch, and we are plowing through 1 Kings chapter 15. We've gotten through the first 24 verses, actually, excuse me, first 32 verses, and we are seeing a lot of themes, and Pastor Lynch, you've you've covered them very well. And now I would say we're at Nadab. Any last thoughts on Nadab before we get to the other <laughs> Israelite kings? So, so Nadab, you know, he uh, uh, he is the king of Israel, and uh, and uh, you know, and and once again, he's one of those kings that uh, he he becomes king in a violent way. Mm. Right? I mean, he kills uh, his successor or his pre- predecessor, and, uh, and and so you have this this pretty brutal way. I mean, and, and you're going to see that in, in Israel from here on out. Most of the kings that take over. They they take over through a violent coup or an overthrow, and they they kill their, their uh, uh, the people that are in charge. And not only do they kill the, the king, but they also kill most of the family members. And as it says here, they even kill you know friends of uh, of of, of Nadab mm. um, and uh, the friends of, of Jeroboam. I'm sorry. So uh, you you have all this this kind of murder going on. Uh, this would make a great a mini series, right? Yeah, uh, I think people would love to watch this. <laughs> but the problem is we don't have a whole. You, you have to get into chronicles to get like the fillers of, of all these accounts. Um, but um, um, yeah, it's it's a it was a violent violent overthrow, and the Nadab didn't last very long. Right? No, it says um, two years only. Correct? It says two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. and we're gonna have. We're going to have, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, and, well, there's another king we're going to get through that only lasts like seven days. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so two years, seven days, not real long. Right? No, no, that is not, that's not real long. One thing that I notice here too is just, it reminds me of the close of the commandments. When we look at the, the um, we look at the, the small catechism, when it talks about how that uh, the, the sins of Jeroboam, are what caused him to do these sins. Uh, verse 30, point. you know, and it's a, it's just a reminder of the sins of the generations prior lead to the sins of the next generations, which I, as past, yeah. as a pastor, how would you address that where someone says, Oh, so like when I do a major sin, there's no chance of my children to have a good and holy life. And then my grandchildren, is that what you're saying? Or how would you address that? Cause it, to me, that's kind of a hard part of scripture to fully understand. Any thoughts? I would say they are following in the footsteps of, I mean, the scripture talks about them kind of following, ha- having the same kind of heart, following in the footsteps, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not that, it's not that, that it, you know, it is difficult to, um, to have a, 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 a child that is going to become a Christian from parents who never take their children to church. It's, it's, you know, I mean, that, that so, so the par- kids tend to follow in their parents' footsteps, and if they're if you're not worshiping, then that makes it difficult for a child. Now we're blessed because it does say you know third or fourth generation, and then hopefully that's broken, where uh, you have someone who follows in a, a, you know a different path and becomes um, you know Christian in that process. But here, I think that's what your your um, well, I think that's what the scriptures are addressing here. It's they they followed in their father's footsteps. Yeah, uh, the apple does not fall far from the tree, right? So um, these kings 
prior, they were not good, and and these and their children just. And we're going to see even more as you read the rest of it that that uh, the kings of Israel even go further away from their, their parents. Their parents took them so far, and now they're going even further away. Right. Um, and then you're going to well, 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 this this so this also deals with who you should marry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pick, pick a good wife, right? Pick a good uh, husband. Uh, pick a, one that is a Christian, a faithful. A, you know, I always say, hey, listen, uh, I want my kids to find good Lutheran uh, kids that they can spend their life with because I, I want them to be with me eternally. And um, and I think there's something to that, right? You know, there is. There's a little link in heaven. There's a little a center wing in heaven, and we want to, you know, propagate that for, so that I get to see my great, 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 great grandchildren, right. and, and so forth. And, and that I think is is part of that um, sins of, of the past of parents that are kind of needed out in the, in the children. Does that, does that make sense? It, it makes total sense that. Because that it, it reaffirms what says in verse 26, he says, He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walk in the way of his father and the sin which he made Israel to sin. It's not a prescription to say, well, your father did this, therefore you have to. But it totally is saying he walked in the same footsteps. The apple did not fall far from the tree. And for us, and this goes back to Solomon when he married foreign wives, the issue was not that they're from a different nation. The problem was that they didn't have faith. And and a lot of times, and I've seen this in ministry, and, and it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts too, is that a lot of times the person who's not in the faith influences those who are in the faith more than the other way around, which is something we always have absolutely. to pray about. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Totally, totally agree with that, I think. And it's not, it's, it's, um, it's just difficult to, uh, you know, it, it, it's much easier to wake up and not go to church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Post COVID, we could talk about that all day, but yeah, it's a very, <laughs> it's a very trying time in that way. And that's what we pray. Like you said, faith comes by hearing and we pray the Holy Spirit to lead us. Now here's an interesting thought too, and we'll move on to the text is, uh, you know, when I was, when I was in high school and college, I did not believe in arranged marriages for Lutherans. But now that I have four children, I think arranged <laughs> Lutheran marriages would be good. What do you think? I'm all for it, man. I'm I'm a hundred percent behind you. I know I'm, you're probably going to catch some flack for that, but uh, uh, you know, I I, uh, I have three kids. Uh, uh, you know, my son just got engaged, and um, uh, he married. Uh, now I married a girl that was a Roman Catholic, and she became Lutheran. And um, you know, and I've asked her, would you go back to the Roman Catholic Church? And she, you know, she's at Don Luther until I die. And, Nice. And so my son is marrying uh, someone who comes from the uh, Greek Orthodox faith. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and I think she's probably going to join the Lutheran Church. Uh, my hope is that we're going to take this instruction and get her to join the Lutheran Church and have that same kind of relationship. But I'm, and that was kind of arranged by my wife. My wife set the two of them up. And, um, and, and so I'm trying to set up my middle son with uh, a young lady who is uh, a good Lutheran girl, and hopefully that will work out. And then our daughter graduates high school this year and is headed off to Concordia, Wisconsin. Wonderful. Uh, where she's going to study uh, in the uh, Director of Christian um, Ministry, I think it's called. Yep. Uh, and, and, and so yeah. she's going to do that, and hopefully we'll find a nice young man for her up there at uh, Concordia, Wisconsin. Well, we yeah, can t- we can t- we can talk after because one of my members is going to Concordia, Wisconsin next year to study pre sem. So we can uh, make our own arrangements. Anyways, well, let's get back to the text. We could talk all day on this. So we are in verse thirty three of chapter fifteen, and uh, we will read thirty three all the way to fourteen. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Basha, the son of Ahijah, began to reign over all Israel at Tirzah, and he reigned twenty four years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, which he made Israel to sin. And the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Basha, saying, Since I exalted you out of the dust and made you leader over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sins, behold, 
I will utterly sweep away Basha and his house, and I'll make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabed. Anyone belonging to Basha who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And anyone who is, dies in the field, the birds of the heavens shall eat. Now the rest of the acts of Basha and what, was, what he did and his might are not written in the book of Chronicles of the king of Israel. And Basha slept with the fathers and was buried at Terzah. And Ela his, son, Ela, his son, reigned in his place. Moreover, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Basha and his house, both because of all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of his hands, and being like the house of Jeroboam, and because he destroyed it. In the twenty-sixth year of Asa king of Judah, Ela, the son of Basha, began to reign over Israel in Terzah, and he reigned two years. But his servant Zimri, Zim, Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him. And he was at Terzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, who was over the house of Terzah. Zimri came in and struck him down and killed him, in the twenty-seventh year of Asa king of Judah, and reigned in his place. When he began to reign, as soon as he had seated himself on his throne, he struck down all the house of Basha. He did not leave him a single male of his relatives or his friends. Thus Zimri destroyed all the house of Basha, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Basha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Basha and the sins of Elah his son, which they sinned and which they made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord of Israel to anger with their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did are not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. Uh, just, I think the, the, the title of this should be Broken, Broken, and then More Broken. Your thoughts on more these broken. verses? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you, you know, you have, uh, you have uh, Basha, and, and, and he uh, is just, once again, following in the footsteps of uh, you know, sinners and just causing more problems and, and doing all kinds of things that are wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And, um, and so he, the prophet, uh, you know, speaks out against them. And, and eventually uh, the Lord, you know, removes them from office. Um, and, 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 and that's kind of the account, right? You have all this, uh, I love how they say, isn't all this written in the book of Chronicles of the Kings? Of Israel? Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. This is what he did. He was not good. He, he did not follow in the way of Yahweh, but he followed in the way of his of his, of his predecessors and, and led the people. Um, now he was he, he was king for twenty forty years, which is kind of astounding. Uh, we, we almost want to say, well, why in the world did the Lord allow that to happen for twenty forty years? Right. Well, um, you know, because th- that's the Lord has a different plan than we have, and um, and He allows things that we might. I think this is a big wrestling point, right, for people, because I think they they think, well, we should have nothing but good. Yeah. We should have nothing but um, sinlessness. We should have nothing but uh, blessings. And, and the Lord allows some horrendous things to happen to His people down through the ages um, from wicked kings that um, just, you know, lead the people. In a, in a, uh, this this uh, anyone belonging to Basha, he dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. Yeah. And anyone of his who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens shall eat. Reminds me of, of the um, the Roman soldiers when they would execute uh, people on uh, during crucifixion. They would they would leave their bodies for the dogs and the birds to, to eat. Mm. And, um, and what, what a what a brutal uh, show of evidence that, you know, you do something wrong in this place, and this is what's going to happen to you. And uh, uh, how, how brutal is that? That the Lord even makes that statement to his prophet, that this is going to take place with um, the house of, uh, with Basha and his house, um, because he kind of followed in the way of Jeroboam. Um, not, not, uh, not, not a comfort. There's a lot of law there. <laughs> There's a lot of law there. <laughs> A lot of law that wasn't being followed as well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, this is a wake-up call, isn't it? Right? This is supposed to be a wake-up call. It shows us our sins so that we can run to the Savior, turn from our sinfulness, and trust in the Lord. I mean, it's the fish hook. I mean, the Lord has got the fish hook out there. He's trying to reel in Basha. 
and, and Basha is just fighting and going in the other direction. And then after Basha, you have uh, Ela. Uh, he doesn't last very long, two years. And I guess he was kind of a drunkard and mm-hmm. uh, spent most of his time, you know, uh, uh, drinking his uh, days uh, as king. Uh, he goes to probably one of his friends' houses in uh, Azra, uh, in, in Olza, trying to kind of hide. And, and one of his uh, commanders of the chariots comes in and kills him. Yeah. And it puts him to death. And um, so now we have uh, Zimri, who is now king of, of Israel. Um, but Zimri's not going to last long. <laughs> no, and that doesn't long, last long either. And that's just, and I think you said it well that the Israel kings, and this is a northern kingdom, um, and, and this can conf- gets confusing too throughout First Kings. And we talk about Israel, we're talking about the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, and then Judah yep. is in the southern end. And this is still a reminder, our listeners, look up a map, um, find find the map of the twelve tribes of Israel, and and it, it is a little bit confusing, especially when you get you know later on. But but right now, the understanding is that the Israelite kings just seem to never be able to grab a hold of faithfulness. And uh, yeah. it, it's hard for me to, you made that great insight to that. And, and that's something for us just to remember that third and fourth generation that the buck can stop here and we can be faithful in repentance and faith, now walking in the footsteps of the, the things that are wrong, but in our own families following in the footsteps of what is right. And it's kind of simplistic, but it's very true. You know, it's not hard, right? I mean, this isn't rocket science. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and I, I think this past Sunday's gospel lesson was wonderful in that, you know, you, last week you had the, the uh, uh, you know, the vine and the branches, and then this mm. week you have this wonderful thing about, it's about abiding in, in the love of God, which is following the commandments of God. Um, and, and Jesus is saying, what is the greatest commandment? Love one another. And, and, and so, you know, yes, you are saved by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus, not by your work. Having said that, your works then follow your and, and are signs of the faith that is present within your heart. And and so these kings, while they say, Oh yeah, we're followers of, of Yahweh, their actions prove otherwise. And 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 I think that's a real struggle that um, we have. We we're, we're great at preaching law and gospel, which we should, and that's necessary and a, and the foundation of what we believe and the foundation of our faith is, is, is the gospel or we're saved by Christ and not by our works. Then those works then follow as, as a necessary part of who we are as, as we deem the children of Israel. We do the commandments of God because they're, they're evidence of our faith. They are evidence of the fruits that grow in us as Christians. And, um, and then it was a real, real challenge, I think, for these kings. Well, well they might say, yeah, we're, we're followers of Yahweh, but, man, oh, man, they're doing, um, and it just gets worse, right? The more you go down here uh, with Israel, it just keeps getting worse until you finally get to Ahab, who uh, marries, um, you know, a pagan, and we can cover that one in a minute or two. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, it definitely does not get better. And this is why in our culture, when we talk about, you know, this is the brokenness you're experiencing now, here's the anxiety you're dealing with. And then it's a little bit disingenuous, especially when you have a king like Basha who la- who lasts for 24 years. You can't just say it's going to get better. <laughs> just because yeah. it's going to get better. No, it might not get better, which is why, once again, it's about faith and trusting in the Lord to help us through all things, you know, neither death nor life or anything else can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus is a passage that comes to mind. There's a great quote from Luther where he's talking, um, I believe it's when he's talking about the two kingdoms, and he's talking about, you know, if, if you want to replace the tyrant who's in office, um, be careful what you wish for, because you may replace that tyrant with five new tyrants. Right. And, uh, and I think that is what we have going on in, in the kings of Israel, you know, replacing one tyrant with five new ones, and um, and they're just not following in the way of Yahweh. 
And this is a good reminder from Paul when he writes to Timothy to pray for those who oversee you, for the um, those who work in the government and leaders, to pray for them on a daily basis. Because as we can see, the stress is very high. So let's continue for 15 through the end. And we have about five or about six minutes left to wrap everything together um, as we once again put on our Christ goggles. Verses 15. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days in Terzah. Now the troops were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the troops who were encamped heard it, said, Zimri has conspired, and he has killed the king. Therefore all Israel made Amri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. So Amri went up from Gibbethon and all Israel with him, and they besieged Tirzah. And when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went to the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house over him with fire and died because of his sins that he committed doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam and for his sin, which committed making Israel to sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and the conspiracy that he made, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, Tibni, Tibni the son of Ginnath. So Tibni died, and Om, Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel, and he reigned for twelve years. Six years he raised and reigned in Tirzah, and he brought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. And he fortified the hill and called the name of the city that he built Samaria, after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. Am- Amri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did more evil than all who were before him, for he walked in all the way of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, and the sins he made Israel to sin provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Amri that he did, and that he might be showed, are not written on the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. And Amri slept with his fathers and is buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son reigned in his place. In the 38th year of Asa king of Judah, Ahab the son of Amri began to reign over Israel, and Ahab the son of Amri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hale of Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid his foundation at the cost of Ibiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Okay, we have about four minutes, yeah. Pastor. What are what are some main themes you see in these verses? So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Omri replaces Zimri, and Zimri is there for seven days. And the reason is that Omri is he's a, he's a uh, he's not really a, even an Israelite, but um, he gets kind of taken up because he's the commander of the army, and they put him in charge. He's not a good guy. He, uh, you know, kind of leads the people down another a bad path. And then when things dies, um, you have Ahab. Now, Ahab, you're going to hear about this quite a lot. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think the next uh, five or six chapters in First Kings are all about Ahab. And Ahab, you know, so as I say, we're going downhill. And Ahab is kind of the bad of the bad. He's going to marry uh, Jezebel, who is the daughter of a... You know, and king, and uh, it's going to lead the people into Baal worship. And he's going to even erect a house uh, for Baal. And um, he sets up this Asherah, and Asherah is kind of like a pole, like I would imagine, uh, some kind of a... a, a so, so the Canaanites worship um, fertility gods, 
Man Baal, obviously, was the king of their fertility gods. Mm. And this Asherah would have been some kind of a wooden pole that represented kind of the, the fertility of, of the land and of the, of the god of Baal. And, uh, and so um, you know, what Asa in um, Judah has removed, um, Ahab is building in Israel. <laughs> Wow. Uh, so you have these, these kind of these two kings that are at odds with each other, one in Israel and one in Judah. And one in Judah is kind of trying to clean up all of this and get back to the worship of Yahweh. And the, the uh, king of Israel, and Ahab, is trying to go in the other direction. In fact, you know, I don't even know if he, he worshiped Yahweh uh, during this time. You know, it would be interesting to continue to finish reading the rest of that and see exactly... But, I mean, it's obvious from what we have in our text today, he's completely in the Baal worship. Yeah, and, uh, it, it's, and it, it just sets up for Elijah, you know, they, it really gets into exactly. that realm that makes you makes you realize, because a lot of times in Sunday school, we'll just read the Elijah story, and we don't think about the, the things that happened before it, but it makes a lot of sense because, like it says, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And then the Lord obviously is faithful and, and leads his people back to himself. Pastor, we have about yeah. 30, okay. we have about 30 seconds left. Uh, what are the last things? What's the, what's the takeaway? What, how would you summarize our two chapters today? Wow. Uh, uh, <laughs> 45 seconds. <laughs> suffering. Holy suffering, right? Yeah, right. I, I, so how would I describe it? I, I think it's simply this, uh, that the Lord is faithful, as you said, and, uh, I mean, you know, the, the prophet is going to come, speak the word of truth, lead the people back, uh, bring them back to him, because that's what the Lord does. Um, we may not understand why uh, certain people um, reign in, in, you know, in our texts here, why the Lord allowed this to happen. But the Lord uses these people for uh, his glory and for our good, and, uh, and, he, and he does the same today. And he did it for the children of Israel and brought it back, and it was the same for us today. And I think that's a, a, a for me, that's a, a key uh, thing to remember. The Lord is always faithful, and the Lord is calling us to faith in Him and trust in Him, that He will take care of us. Pastor Keith Lynch of Grace Lutheran Church in Naples, Florida, pointing us to God's grace and to God's faithfulness in 1 Kings chapter 15 and 16. Pastor Lynch, thank you for being our guest. Happy to do it. God bless you. You too. Saints of our Lord, the words, the people are, are real people, just like you and me. Abijam, Asa, Nadab, Basha, uh, Ahab, all of them. A mouthful for sure, but also a lot of brokenness, sinfulness, a need for God's grace. And we have the same thing. Before we start looking at them in uh, haste, let us remember our own sin and repent and look to our Lord Jesus, who gives us grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. In him, we have everything we need. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.